uh, up to his most recent work, the 2015 Surfing Uncertainty, which explores current cutting-edge claims about how bodies and brains interact with environments using what's known as predictive processing. And he was elected a fellow of the British Academy in 2015. You may have seen an amazing profile of him written up in The New Yorker by Larissa McFarquhar just this past week, and if you haven't, I highly recommend it. It was a really good article. Um, one of the most amazing things about the work that Amy Clark brings to us is that it crosses disciplinary boundaries in the most polite way possible. If you take seriously the claims he will discuss with us tonight, you will see implications ripple out onto fields way beyond philosophy and cognitive science. This work matters for our arts, our scientific methodologies, our morals, our interactions with our environments, physical, cultural, social, for the ways we encounter our tools in anthropology and in our everyday lives, for our richly varied embodied forms from the things we experience daily and those things we study in disability studies and critical identity studies, and what it means to be the kinds of creatures that we are, what it means to be human. Let's warmly welcome Andy Clark to Boyd College. Quick 
little bit of, of, of history for the sake of it, really. Uh, the term cyborg kind of comes from the early days of the, of the space race, really, where the thought was, um, instead of trying to, as it were, engineer environments to enable humans to live in space, why not engineer humans so that they can live in the environments that space or spaceships already provide? Um, that was the kind of thinking in this paper published in 1960 by Kleins and Klein, Cyborgs in Space. Um, yeah, that's it. Why not retrofit the humans to the harsh environments of space? Create human-machine hybrids in which implanted electronics use cybernetic techniques. This was the era of cybernetics, you know, to use feedback to regulate bioprocesses like metabolism, breathing, heart rate, weight cycle, sleeping cycle. And there's a there is probably the first ever cyborg uh, of a certain kind, anyway, the first implant kind of cyborg. Uh, and this is a, a rat that doesn't actually have a name, but had a rose osmotic pump implanted into it to kind of regulate some of its bodily functions so that it could survive longer in space. Um, I think it's uh, Donna Haraway that says that, uh, that, that that rat belongs in the sort of species family album, and so we should uh, you know, give it its moment stage, let's call it Rose. Uh, so this is a big coined this term, for the exogenously extended organizational complex, we propose the term cyborg, cybernetic organism that deliberately incorporates exogenous outside e components to adapt it to new environments. So, you know, that's where that kind of talk comes from, but I don't think that's the way that we hear the word now so much. I think we hear it with a much, much broader meaning than that. If you go to, uh, you know, a natural place to go for things, Wikipedia, go to Wikipedia, what you'll get is a being with both biological and artificial, e.g. electronic, mechanical, or robotic parts. But even there, that notion of parts, I think we're, we're going to have to be fairly um, accommodating about. You know, you might think that parts of you have to be attached to you, but I don't think that's the case, um, and we'll um, talk about that as we go along. So I think what matters isn't the nature of the connection, it's whether things are connected to you. So whatever the right notion of parthood here is, I don't think it's all about physical connection. Um, it's just the nature of the new holes that are created. So I think when we couple with old technologies like pen and paper, we create new holes that are kind of thinking holes in themselves. And I think that kind of coupling is probably sufficient to actually um, bring about a, a wave of new cyborg nature, if you like. So that would be a perfectly good cyborg um, representation, I think. So there's lots of people whose work is clearly, you know, I'm, I'm sort of riffing on themes that are, are there in, in loads of places. And here's a few, Dennis Pigotsky, Varela, Thompson, Rush, Brunham, Norman, Heidegger, Gibson, Muller, Conti, Bateson. There's, you know, that list could be indefinitely extended if my slides were bigger. Um, so, for the ones that are your favourites that I've missed, yes, um, let's add them in. So, that was all preamble. Uh, I'll say a bit about augmenting the body, a bit about extending the senses, a bit about enhancing the mind, and then get back to, um, to that deacon, Patrick Jones, as a kind of exemplar of why it might actually matter. Because, you know, there, there's a sense in which some of the things I'm saying might seem to be you like mere semantics, just like how should we use certain words. But I think they, they actually do have impact or importance that goes beyond that. So, augmenting the body. Um, you know, prosthetics programs are, are clearly um, changing our notion of what it means to be a body part, I think. Expanding, extending our notion of what it means to be a body part. A while ago, Dan Dennett applied this to the notion of the self, if you like and says, I am the sum total of the parts that I control directly. And that seems like a good place to start, quite a good idea that somehow what I am is the set of things that I control. You can't have the eye get pushed too far back there, you don't want a little homunculus kind of lurking around. It's kind of like, I am the sweep of stuff that gets controlled in this sort of way. So how exactly should we unpack that? What does it mean to control directly? Um, so in that, I'm sort of a little bit kind of Heideggerian, I guess. Um, you know, you, if you're doing the washing up, you don't typically feel as if you're using your hand to do the washing up. Your hand just kind of is part of the sweep of things that enables washing up, and you bring about washing up. Um, so you feel as if you're washing up because 
because your hand has become, in a certain sense, transparent equipment. It's equipment you can use to act on the world without having to think very hard about the equipment itself. So, you know, if you're writing, scribbling down uh, stuff on a page as you think it through, you don't have to think about the pencil or the, or the shape of the paper, mostly, or anything like that. Um, so, transparent equipment doesn't mean it's totally faded away. You know, I can, I can, I can see my hand. Um, but somehow in use, I'm just acting on the world through that stuff. I don't have to target it for thought. So I think this is pretty close to Heidegger's 1927 ready-to-hand sort of notion. So talking of hands, uh, you know, you could, have, you could have extra ones or extra arms anyway. Um, this is Stellark. Um, Stellark is a performance artist, Australian performance artist, who spent quite a lot of time exploring different kinds of body augmentation from sort of, you know, kind of swallowing things that kind of expand and explode inside you to, um, to working with the, the third hand here. Um, the third hand is, is set up sort of like this. You can see there's a fair bit of underlying, um, underlying kit there. There's a sort of, if you can't see it, there's a kind of web of electronics and a kind of portable um, power supply. So there's a bunch of electrodes implanted on different muscle sites on Stellark's um, abdomen and the third hand is controlled by controlling muscles on your abdomen and uh, what's going on there is picked up and transferred to the third hand. Uh, so this is surface electromyography EMG to move the arm what Stellar's brain has to do is control those abdominal um, sites. Um, yeah, so that, that's, that, that's bringing about particular patterns of movement in the third hand. But what's interesting, what's important for me here, is that um, after a while, a little bit of practice, a couple of years of practice, um, Stellar doesn't feel or didn't feel as if um, he was controlling muscle sites on his abdomen anymore. That had sort of fallen silent, become transparent, whatever you want to say. Now he just, he just controlled the third hand and used it to, to do things. Um, so, so that's the idea. He doesn't feel as if he has to twitch a stomach muscle to move the third hand. You just kind of will the third hand to move. The way that that will expresses itself and gets the body to do, or gets this extended by the technological body to do something, is via this um, set of muscle sites. It's all very fluid. I mean, he can do things like right backwards using three hands at once. Um, that's, I, you know, obviously I can do this with two hands at once, so it's amazing the skills that you can acquire. Um, one of the things that we'll be looking at here is the, you know, the extent to which our own neural plasticity is so great that there's this huge sweep of things that we could be and that we could do. Uh, yeah. So, I think the third hand is now transparent equipment. He acts on the world without first willing and act on anything else. And of course, you know, you don't really have to be a, a biotechnological kind of um, performance artist to experience things like this. I think just by driving a car, you're already experiencing something like this. Uh, or by using a musical instrument or a sports racket. You know, you don't think about the tennis racket when you're playing tennis. That's not really a good thing to be doing. You think about what you're trying to do, what you're trying to achieve, and the tennis racket is just kind of part of achieving it. So it's become transparent equipment in that sort of way. Um, and of course, what's interesting about all of these bits of kit is they're not permanent. You know, Stellar didn't go to bed with the third, you know, the third hand attached, and we don't go to bed with our tennis rackets. Mostly. So. Um, so, I think it's also true that the, this notion of directness, the, you know, that the characterizes this kind of control, it's, there's nothing about the nature of any particular signals or the nature of the medium that they're flowing through, whether it's, you know, the, the, the wires of the electromyelography detecting circuitry and so on, or whether it's nerve fibers, or it's stuff coming in through vision or it's proprioceptive coupling with your um, tennis racket. Doesn't matter what the medium is or what the signals are like. What it's all about, I think, is just the extent to which the mind, I've got here the conscious mind, but actually I'm not sure that that's right. Um, I think it should just be the mind, so ignore that word conscious on there, just pretend it's not out there. <laughs> Can, um, treat that tool in that kind of way. Can, uh, reach right through the tool to do what needs to be done in the world.
And I think our own sense of our own embodiment is just like that. We'll come back to that more towards the end. Your sense of the shape of your body and the capacities of your body, that's malleable and negotiable. Um, work by Jaron Lanier on so-called homuncular flexibility is quite interesting here. So Lanier, who was um, you know, one of the, the kind of pioneers of the virtual reality kind of work, um, has been looking at virtual lobster bodies. Um, so the, the idea here is that you can, as it were, feel as if you're embodied in a virtual lobster shape. You've got lots of tiny arms sprouting from the middle, and the, the, this body is controlled by little motions of the wrist, that sort of thing. Um, what, one of the things that Lanier was experimenting with was turning school children into little sort of letting them um, inhabit molecules so that they could get hands-on chemistry lessons by uh, sort of engaging in various kinds of uh, atomic binding for themselves. So um, this is some uh, Andrea Stevenson from that, uh, Stevenson one from that group. And she says that when they first tried this stuff, the, the lobster stuff, the, the yeah, that the kind of tiny arm lobster thing. Most people fail very, very badly at it. Um, only Lanier and a few others who were especially sort of, um, I don't know, kind of pre-biased towards this sort of thing um, could easily control the third hand. But what they found was that that wasn't the kind of permanent limitation. That limitation itself had a sort of technological fix. Uh, the technological fix was to um, give people experiments, sort of train them in the use of this extra lobster body shape, um, where they were kind of felt like they were in an environment where they were trying to pop all kinds of balls, with, you know, balloons, I should say, um, by, by kicking things around in the world, in the virtual world. So in that setting, uh, apparently people adapt very quickly within five minutes to the presence of a controllable third arm. So that's the sort of training that, that seems to sort of bring it rapidly under, under control. I think because you're closing perception action loops that way. There's something very important we'll come back to it when we look at the um, tactile visual sensory stimulation stuff. There's something very important about closing an action loop, being able to sort of use the new equipment to act on the world and get sensory stuff back from that. Um, so, you know, that stuff is clearly useful stuff. Uh, it's had some success in treating complex regional pain syndrome. So, this will be cases where you have a sort of a, a kind of virtual reality therapy that um, enables you to sort of see your body doing things, make kind of um, stretches that you can't currently make, or to engage in operation in sort of movements that you would currently find painful. Um, but what they do is that they use your own body to kind of control the virtual reality setup, but they may switch the bit of the body that is responding. So if you've got one leg that can actually do, do a certain motion um, sort of uh, further or without pain, then you can kind of switch it so it now looks as if it's a painful or less mobile limb that is doing that. And that practice is really helpful to people, apparently. Uh, subjects show evidence after that of increased real-world movement, flexibility, and decreased pain. So it's, it's got some relation to work some of you will have seen that Ramachandran has done with sort of the use of mirror boxes to treat phantom limb pain, where you kind of kind of show someone a limb in the prep in the place where the phantom limb would be, and then they can do things like get rid of um, cramps by actually moving the limb out. So you're getting this again. I think you're completing a feedback loop that wasn't otherwise being completed and that is um, able to train uh, the biological uh, system in the right sort of way. So in that sense, I think V.S. Ramachandran has the right sort of idea about all this, that you know, there's a sense in which your own body is just a, a kind of phantom limb that you have all the time, something like that. It's, um, your own body is a, a kind of phantom that is a temporary construct that is just convenient for the control of the kinds of action that you currently have the abilities to perform. Um, so it's a nice book, uh, Phantoms in the Brain, for the Ministry of the Human Mind. And it makes sense that, you know, we shouldn't be locked into one form of embodiment. Um, you know, human bodies do alter, you know, we, we start small and we end up bigger and bits drop off. And, you know, so you have to be the kind of system that is preset to sort of change its body image in response to change in circumstances. Um, so it makes sense, I think, to have the sort of body schema 
which is perhaps a bit more fundamental in the body image, um, being computed on the go as a result, uh, sort of in the in the light of the evidence that the brain is getting from perception action cycles that are being held in place in the world. So I think the moral of all that is that the, if you think of the body as a sort of set of equipment, the set of stuff that is transparent in use and that you can achieve your ends with, then um, that's kind of essential, I think, to cognition. We'll come to that a little bit later. But it's very negotiable. The, the, the form and limits of your own body are open to recomputation. If you were equipped with a third hand tonight and the right control system, then by the end of next week, you would just feel like someone that can do certain kinds of things with their third hand. You wouldn't feel like you're controlling the third hand anymore if it was well done. Um, recent ways of prosthetically enabled athletes offer a, a good illustration of this. You know, there's a, think about someone like a double leg amputee marathon runner, uh, or, or the little scooter thong, scooter thong, scooter thong, it's so hard to say, with a leg. Um, or Amy Mullins, who set Paralympic records, um, several of them. She currently uses 12 sets of legs and likes to vary her height between 5 foot 8 and 6 foot 1 according to the um, according to the context that she's currently inhabiting. Sometimes you just want to be that bit taller. Um, so going back to, uh, uh, to a Persian philosopher scientist uh, living between 980 and 1037 AD, this is um, Avicenna, who in De Anima wrote, these bodily members, you know, limbs and so on, are as it were no more than garments, which because they've been attached to us for a long time, we think are us or parts of us. And the cause of this is a long period of adherence. We're accustomed to taking our clothes off at night and throwing them down, which we're not accustomed to do without bodily members. So I think um, you know that's um, that's certainly true. But perhaps we will become more and more accustomed to that, so that we may start to think that uh, these bodily forms are more like um, more like constantly negotiable garments than we currently do. But if you do start to think in terms of garments, you might wonder, well, garments for what? You know, what sort of, what's kind of left here? Well, there's a the mind, there's the senses, but they turn out to be just as negotiable as the embodiment itself. So that's where this goes to now. Oh, I put one of these in now again, because I, I sometimes talk too fast and I can stop and breathe for a minute. So if we think about extending the senses, then the natural place to start is with that old 1960s, it's a very 1960s looking guy here, um, from the original article. Think about TVSS work, tactile visual sensory substitution. It works the way the title says it works. Um, you take somebody that, uh, that, that, that is blind and you um, pick them up with one of these sort of touch pads. It's not touch pads now, but it was back in the 1960s. Um, the touchpad takes information from the camera, turns it into a pattern of tactile information. And after a certain amount of practice, people can make use of that information in a fairly fluent way. Um, not super fluent, we'll get to the, you know, oh, we can talk about the, the, the limitations of this stuff and why it's limited in the way that it is. Um, but the sort of effect you will get is something like uh, after, after becoming fluent in the use of that kind of stuff, if someone threw a ball at you from the side, you would instinctively duck. You wouldn't have to sort of think, oh, I've got that sort of little pattern of tactile stuff that means the ball coming at me, better duck. That would be too late. Um, but that's not what happens. You just, it's kind of, the response becomes automatic like that. Um, in order to get that kind of, oh, this is the sort of thing that people use now, like a tiny um, electrical stimulation pad that would be put on the tongue, something like that. It's about the size of a um, yeah. So what was important in bringing those effects about, and this is that close in the perception action loop again, uh, is active control of the camera. So at first those experiments didn't work at all, uh, and that's because the camera was just a type kind of fixed entity given this sort of information, that the, the person couldn't move the camera around. But as soon as the subject has control over the camera, then they're able to sort of start to weave the, the information that's coming from the camera back into these perception action loops. That's when we get the reports of, um, you know, the ducking, the experience of a looming object, and so on. So there are lots of 
things a bit like this around now. There's one that just uses, uh, instead of using uh, tactile stuff, is a, a, a kind of soundscape version. This is Mayer's uh, so-called The Voice. I only recently kind of noticed what Mayer's is doing there. The OIC in the middle, that's why it's got that sort of funny thing that irritated me before. Uh, I see it now. Uh, OIC, yeah. Uh, but all of these things need a lot of practice. And also the front ends aren't all that good right now. And I suspect that they're, you know, severe limits on, on sensory substitution are mostly due to limited front ends and not translating stuff into the right format for the brain to do the right stuff with it as quickly as it needs to. Um, I was part of a four-year uh, open university project looking at some of this stuff. And, uh, you know, it's severely limited at the moment. But the, I think the, the possibility is kind of there. Coarse sensory systems are better at it at the moment. Um, a really good application is leprosy patients who have lost feeling in their, in their fingertips. And if you fit the leprosy patients with, um, with gloves that have sensors in the fingertips, and you um, train people with a kind of a, a panel on the forehead, or whatever you like, really, that is transmitting signals to a tactile array of some kind, then very rapidly those people start to report feeling things again, feeling touch at the fingertips. So, you know, even though all that's on your fingertips are these sensors pushing touch information somewhere else on your body, that's not the way it feels to you. And that actually is a successful application. So it's pretty obvious once you start looking at those things that uh, the, the, the potential here isn't just to sort of offset stuff that has gone wrong, but to uh, augment and enhance human capabilities. Um, you know, it'd be very easy, I think, to start to expand and morph the basic repertoire of sensing. But, I mean, we've done stuff like, you know, humanity has done stuff like this already, just by having night vision binoculars and binoculars at all, and so on. Um, this is, a, this is a contact lens that is, um, that is a round and workable, switchable telescopic contact lens where so you can have a sort of a, a lens implant that gives you um, sort of binocular vision and a quick toggle if you, uh, if you should want it. So, uh, so I think pretty soon we'll see more of that. I was asked today what my own favourite augmentation would be if I could have one. And I'd probably go for one of these souped up lens in parts because it's a well understood technology, um, it's just a little bit extra and if it goes wrong you just put that lens out and stick a different one in. So you know, I, I, that's, that's where I go right now. Um, this is a nice project, uh, I know these people are a bit field space project people, they, they, they fitted people with a, a belt that had a sort of an array of little sort of motory things in like the things that make your phone vibrate basically. Um, they connected those vibrotactile vibro units to something that sensed where magnetic north was. So as I would move around like this, I would get a little sort of bars in the direction of, of northness, like magnetic northness, roughly. Um, and so that's kind of a sort of interesting thing to experience. Six weeks of constant daily wear, a little bit of targeted training, and people displayed improved spatial awareness, sort of new. You know, if you ask me, I don't know, where is this building relative to the commons thing? I'd to go with some of it show right now. But if I'd been wearing the belt today as I walked around, um, is this the commons I'm in? I'm not in it. Okay. Is that that's possible. Uh, anyway, if I'd been wearing the belt, I maybe would have done it a little bit more. Uh, this is what people say. As intuitively aware of the direction of my home or of my office, I would wait in line in the cafeteria and spontaneously think, oh, my house is over there. You know, that's a change from the sort of stuff that you know kind of intuitively. Um, but more interesting than that, I think, is that there was uh, signs of the kind of integration of this new stuff with the old stuff. So there are, some, um, there, there, there are particular um, effects here where the, where the way your eyes, the way that your um, the way that your eyes move is sort of related to information about how your body is currently oriented, and that particular um, that particular effect was altered in the subjects of all this belt. So the kind of thing is that the, the new capacity here is becoming integrated in an, un at an unconscious level with the old capacities. So that's, I think, um, 
suggest here. That's Kevin O'Regan in a nice 2011 book said here. It seems then that with practice you can start creating a kind of six magnetic sense which can be integrated into automatic unconscious behaviours. So. so the moral of all that is that maybe our senses are just more garments. So the body's one set of garments, if you like, and then the senses are another set of garments. They're alterable, changeable, enhanceable, not fixed and immutable. Um, so what about the mind? Um, surely the mind, at least, you know, what's behind all this stuff? Maybe that's where we're going to find the mind. Just, uh, gets one layer down. It's not really. So. <coughs> So I think a good place to start here is just the thought that um, the brain itself is, is sort of very much uh, engineered, if you like, to be as lazy as possible. It's engineered to lean as heavily on opportunities in the body and the world as it can in order to get things done. But it's after all, you know, sort of metabolically quite expensive resource to have a brain, and you really want to, you know, uh, run it using as little energy as possible. And so I think brains like ours are really good at learning to do the least to get the right results. They're productively lazy, as my old computer science professor Aaron Sloan used to say. Uh, what that means is that they take all kinds of opportunities to simplify what they're doing to make the most of what's robustly available in the body or the world. So here's a thing. If I say, OK, I want to pick a card and remember your card. Just concentrate on your card. Now, did I manage to get your card? That would be very good. I think I probably did manage to get your card. I'd be surprised if I didn't. Um, we could go back and do that again. Pick one of those cards, remember it. I'm sure I got your card again. This is one of these things that, oddly enough, is, it, it is more compelling if you've just got two photocopied pages where, you know, this is one of those pages and this is the other photocopied page. And then you can win some money down the path by repeating this again and again, getting people's card, um, and they sometimes find it puzzling. But, you know, the actual explanation is not that puzzling at all. Um, some people will have probably see what's going on here already. What's going on here is, here's one set of cards. They all have a certain character. They're kind of colorful, big, royal cards of one kind or another. Here's another set of cards. They all have the same kind of broad character. They're all colourful, big royal cards of one kind or another. But there is no overlap whatsoever between the cards in one of these sets and the cards in the other set. Meaning that whatever card you happen to choose, I'm going to manage to zap your card quite successfully by going down to the next photocopied page or whatever. Um, but an awful lot of subjects don't notice that. That's why you can win money down the path doing this sort of thing. They don't notice, as it were, that these cards are totally different to these cards. Why would that be? Maybe that's because what you encoded when you looked at the first set of cards, partly because I was asking you to remember your card. I'm, I'm putting your attention on one thing, to remember your card. So maybe you encode as little as you can get away with for the rest. You don't encode their actual identities, you just encode Something like what well, I said, you know, lots of big royal cards of different colours. Um, oh, yeah, come on, yeah. So that's the explanation. Um, so one thought would be, that what's going on here is, you know, you're fooled by the illusion because you kind of feel like you saw all of, or you're fooled by the trick here, because you, you know, you kind of felt like you saw all of those cards first time around. And in some way, you sort of did. But what but I think the impression that you saw in detail of those cards might be due to the fact that your brain knows that if you were looking at this array, if I go back to it, any of them, that if you needed to get detailed information about the cards that weren't yours, you could get it easy by leaning on the world, just the card in the round. You know what that information is, your brain knows the information's there, because you already control at that point the ability to get that information back at the right time, maybe that's why you feel like you kind of already have bio-encoded it. But maybe you haven't already bio-encoded it. You left that bit of stuff in the world. But it felt like you bio-encoded it. So let's catch up on it. Catch up. Yeah. So what they suggest, I think, is that we're just good at trading access against bio-encoding. Um, and that's, uh, you know, anecdotally, there are other places you'll see that. If I say to you, do you know the time? You might very well say yes, and then look at your watch, or you know, look at your phone, or whatever. Um, you don't say, no, I don't know the time yet, hang on a bit, let's find out. Um, that's not what we say. 
we kind of feel as if we're already in control of that information. So I think that uh, one of the things, and this is of course a bridge to the extending my kind of story, is that you know, performing in natural ecological context, brains like ours will be as lazy as they can be. They'll leave information out in the world um, and count themselves, if you like, as already knowing it, as long as they can get the information at the right time to, um, to serve the needs of the person. You see this in, uh, in older work in robotics uh, and cognitive psychology. In robotics, you've got Rodney Brooks, who famously said the world is its own best model. Let's not try and model the richness of the world in the head, but leave as much of that richness in the world as possible, but have systems that are good at getting what they need when they need it. So a lot of work in sort of just-in-time retrieval of the right information for the world to do the job. Kevin O'Regan uh, was quoted earlier. Um, had the notion in psychology of the world as external memory, same kind, of, same kind of idea. We also use loops into the environment in a way that I think is cognitively powerful. If you think about scribbling and sketching while you think, the perspective that I'm trying to sell is one where that scribbling and sketching is kind of part of a process of thinking. It's not that you're kind of thinking in here and then doing a little something out here and then doing thinking in here again. Um, Richard Feynman, uh, the you know, obviously the famous physicist, um, in a conversation with uh, a historian called Beiner, uh, Beiner, the historian, remarked casually that a bunch of notes and sketches were a record of Feynman's day-to-day -day work. Rather characteristically, Feynman reacted sharply to this and said, no, I did the work on the paper. The historian says, well, the work was done in your head and the record of it is still here on the paper. And Feynman's response is, no, it's not a record, it's working. You have to work on paper, and this is paper, okay? So I like to think, like, you know, I love to think of Feynman as a kind of early extended mind theorist in this, uh, in this quote. The idea is that paper is not just a place where you kind of offload and reload information. There's something much more organic going on. Um, not quite like just using a sticky note to remind yourself of something tomorrow. You really are kind of thinking things through as you loop out in, into the paper or other ways into the world. Yeah. So it wouldn't be that all the thinking happens inside and the rest is just about, um, about memory. Instead, uh, there would be this sort of picture of a, an extended circuit. You might think, though, that if you're looping out into the world in that sort of way, well, at least BioU has to be the instigator of the looping out process. So if I'm scribbling what I think, well, I know it's normally, you know, the page doesn't start scribbling and I kind of get dragged in. Not yet, I'm sure that's coming soon. Um, but I don't think that BioU has to be the instigator of the loop here. So there's some nice work from MIT, so-called memory glasses work. These were aids to recall for people with impaired memory or with uh, visual agnosia, actually, is another application. People that couldn't recognize um, what objects were in front of them. So this is kind of early version of uh, wearable computing stuff. Um, thing with the memory glasses where they match the current scene to stored information and cue the subject. So it would be something like, you know, I suppose you had um, a whole bunch of family members. It might store visual templates of the family members, and then if you encounter one of them, it would flash up some information about who the family member was. It doesn't sound terribly powerful as it stands, but what's kind of interesting is that they could flash that cue so rapidly that you would have no feeling of being cued. See what I mean? So it would just be uh, sort of flashed so fast that you didn't consciously see it. Nonetheless, your ability to recognize the person that you were encountering was greatly improved by the presence of that, of that flash because you're kind of cueing unconscious processing of information all the same. Um, and subjects like that a whole lot better. Uh, I think it says something about how I wish to feel that it's by us that's doing the work, even when it's not by us that's doing the work. Somehow we just like it better if we think that our brain's done it all. I think that's just something we've got to get over. Yeah. So again, it's easy to imagine cases that enhance knowledge rather than restore it. But recognize that being around for a few years now makes a 3D face map from a, a photograph. Uh, what that means is it can match its now 3D face map to any picture of you from near enough any picture of you from any angle. Um, so now imagine that you're wearing a head-mounted camera, maybe some funkier descendant of Google Glass, 
that camera is constantly looking at what you look at, recognizer is up and running, recognizer is, is hooked into some kind of social um, social site or other, if you know, if Facebook survives, which it may or may not, then it's gonna be Facebook. Uh, at that point you can set up all kinds of cool things. You can say, look, if the person that I happen to be glancing in their direction right now, if they if they're listed somewhere online as a fan of the Admiral's ice hockey team, you get a little vibrotactile buzz somewhere on your body. And that could be made to fall beneath the level of surface feel, you don't feel the buzz. You just start to sort of think, yeah, yeah, Admiral's fan. Uh, you know, when that becomes incorporated transparent equipment through which you encounter the wider world, then I think just knowing who is probably an Admiral's fan just becomes one of the kind of things that you know by looking around the world. Um, that would be interesting. A bit like knowing about magnetic north in the field space experiments. So there's kind of no limit to what sorts of information could be fed to us in these sorts of ways. And I think that these sorts of resources, you know, stuff that is continuously up and running, kind of feeding information, responding to the world, I think it's useful to compare those to unconscious neural processes. Um, if you thought for a for example, to take another kind of example of that, if you, if you had little software agents that were busy doing things in the world, bringing kind of, kinds of information um, to the fore for bio you to consider them, if you kind of grew up with those and they learned about you and, uh, and you began to just rely on their action, then I think they would really count as kind of parts of you. So if they went down, you would feel as if you'd had a kind of mild overnight stroke or something like that. Um, in these cases, I think you don't really use these apps. They just they just function and they're part of you. Um, I want to say in these cases, you're now the bigger biotechnological hybrid pole. Stop them really. So now we get to um, we get to the stuff about the future. There's a future. That's what it looks like. Um, <laughs> so. I think the future is this kind of uh, this kind of constant enmeshing. I think we're going to become increasingly enmeshed with these webs of support. I think augmented reality is going to play a huge role here. That you know, as we get used to there being these kind of overlays of of information on the physical world, then the differences between the physical world and the informational world will become less and less important to the point in which I think we just start to think, look, it's just one world. It just manifests in different ways, some of them that involve, you know, kinds of technology that the other one doesn't. Um, and, you know, some of the, the sort of dovetail, well-harmonized holes here will be very temporary ones, and others will be longer term. Um, the more temporary ones, I think, will routinely include things that enable us to experience interacting with, with the world in different forms of embodiment. I suspect that would be morally quite important, quite useful. I think also uh, we'll interact with these mixtures of real, virtual, and augmented reality objects, and, and that will be a, that will be fairly transformative. So cheap, effective VR technology is obviously the way in here. Um, you know, V, Oculus, these things, and kind of cheaper, relatively cheap, but robust technologies will move this along. The gender swap work from the machine to be another lab is, is something I quite like. It's quite low tech, but it's got some power, I think. Um, what they do is they use immersive virtual reality with body tracking, and it enables you to experience um, ways of interacting with the world where perhaps you would be a lot shorter than you are, or a lot taller than you are, or in some of their work, in a way you have at least a thin experience of having a differently gendered body. So. Um, what they do in most of these is you would calibrate by touching hands so that that would give you, I mean, you're wearing a sort of a, you know, you're wearing a headset that is showing to you what the other person, what the camera on the other person's headset is seeing when they look down. So your headset reveals their body, their headset reveals your body, you've touched hands and because, you know, the touch and being touched thing is kind of simultaneous there. That sort of brings the illusion nicely online. Um, and as long as you cooperate while you're doing this, that's to say you both move your hands in the same way at the same time, then there's a pretty strong feeling of temporarily having a different kind of body. Of course, you break that feeling at any time by just moving your hand differently. That breaks it. 
definitely worth a look. Be another lab. Uh, there's some nice, uh, some nice stuff online. Um, what's going on there? Hey, what's it doing? I thought there was another bit. Okay. So one way that that has been used is to enable wheelchair users to experience fluid embodied dance in the walking, which is interesting. It's um, you know there's quite a lot to say uh, about that. I think and perhaps that will come back up in discussion. Um, certainly, I think that there, there, there could be something useful here, although it would you would want to be um, sort of I don't know kind of. Of it, sort of able-bodied by a normative about it in some way, but it could still be a very, I think, a very useful kind of experience. And the wheelchair users that did experience this mostly seem to really like it. So. Wrong way. So another frontier here, I think, is wearable robotics in general. So this is wearable robotics for skill transfer. Um, a good project here is a parasitic humanoid project. You know. Um, only in Japan does pattern the words parasitic humanoid conjure something that you want and think is going to be good. Um, but the parasitic humanoid project turns full body VR into a kind of tool for skill transmission. Um, by full body VR, what they mean here is virtual reality stuff that involves vision, hearing, touch, force, um, force feedback, body position, vestibular balance feedback as well. Um, so they actually have sort of things that, um, that directly stimulate your sort of uh, vestibular system so that you feel as if you're balanced in the world in the way that you would feel if you were in some other orientation like upside down right now or something. Um, so it's, uh, it's quite extensive is the point there. Um, the idea is all of these things are monitored on an expert and being to the parasitic humanoid, the wearable robot, um, the kind of thing more by someone else. So they've done it for you know things like knot tying. You have an expert knot tire that leads the novice tire and the novice knot tire through the motions, if you like. Um, an important part of this is a view sharing part. You have to you have to move your head to look in the way that the expert is looking, otherwise you don't see anything. So the way this is set up is until your eyes are aligning themselves properly with the scan path of the expert you get no visual information at all. So that drives you very quickly to align your, your scan path with the expert. Um, so this allows people to learn, um, not just to, I mean, it's not just you can do it while the expert's attached. It's just a quick way of learning how to do it, if you see what I mean. But while the expert's attached, you certainly can do it pretty easily. Um, not times of interest to me as a sort of novice sailor, I, you know, not sure a bit of a puzzle to me. It would be good to be led through them. I'm also a novice theremin player. And wow, I would really love to experience this for how to play the theremin because it's really difficult. I never played violin. Um, but you know, you can have a, the experienced theremin player uh, sort of leading your eye motions and your hand motions in the right way at the right time with the right feeling of balance. Um, and of course, you can then dispense with the expert. They don't have to be tied on, they just have a, a kind of computer system that monitors what the expert is doing and that can then play the role of the expert so it can be the right start to you at the right time. So I do think that uh, this sort of integration of, of standard, I don't know what to call it, like, like reality, reality, I'll call it standard reality, um, augmented and virtual reality, I think in the end we're just going to think this is just reality in all its kind of many, many layers. And maybe Pokemon Go will one day be remembered as our first sort of um, compelling species level taste of the ontological unimportance of brute physical presence. <laughs> so there's a kind of flip side to all this I think is, is puzzling. Um, so the parasitic humanoid thing, they also talk about passing medical skills around in this way. So if someone had an accident, you could just like strap on the parasitic humanoid and perform a minor operation on the person by being led through the right kind of through the space in the right way. That's kind of interesting, I think. That suggests to me that to the extent that that technology is robust and we know how to use it and we trust it, then maybe we kind of accrue new obligations. Maybe, you know, if that suit was around and someone had a, a nasty accident, you, you, know, you knew that you could operate on them in a fairly sort of dramatic kind of way, but probably successfully by donning the suit, 
then I think you probably have a moral obligation to Dr. Seward. It would be a bit like being a doctor on a plane and, you know, something happens to someone. You've got an obligation to help because you've got that knowledge. I think maybe our notion of the knowledge that you've got that gives you moral obligations will extend and expand in this sort of way. It's certainly implied by the extended mind story, I think. You know, all of these stories where easy access and possession turn out to be pretty much the same thing, you know, do I, do I have that skill or can I just easily, easily, you know, do I buy a habit or can I easily access it? Yeah. Over there, Patrick. Yeah. Patrick Jones. So, um, you might ask why does this all matter? So, if you think about someone like Patrick Jones, Patrick Jones uh, has the sort of memory, uh, kind of memory impairments that the character in the film Memento had. So, um, he was, he, he basically did a lot of mountain biking and fell off a lot as a, as a kid. So he banged his head repeatedly um, to the point at which, uh, which he couldn't remember something. Uh, it's, you know, if you came into the room and said hello and went out to the room and came back, he wouldn't remember the previous encounter with you, that kind of thing. So, repeated traumatic brain injury. But he is now a, a, a pretty successful working Catholic deacon in Colorado Springs. Um, his life, you know, 20, 30 years ago, his life would have been very, very, very diminished. But it's not very diminished right now. There's no super high-tech stuff here. He uses a bunch of uh, old-fashioned software, actually. He still uses Evernote, you know. He's got Curio. He uses an iPhone. So it's, it's not, it's not high-tech stuff. A lot of off-the-shelf packages, but he uses them to create lots and lots of webs of notes and reminders and pictures. And whenever he meets anyone or does anything, he consults those, those trails, those webs. Um, it's, a, it's a remarkable feat. He's good at this in part because he actually was fairly techy before. Um, so it's much harder to, to pick up these skills when you have sort of bio-impairments if you don't have them already. You, intensive training can enable you to, for example, use an iPhone if you never did. But it's like training a monkey, basically. It's, you know, takes an awful lot of training, whereas for him, um, he, can just, he can just use his stuff immediately. Uh, so it's only because of that that he can remember you know, what he's doing as a deacon in Colorado Springs. Uh, remember what was decided, what projects he's currently involved in, um, you know, how he feels about different people, and so on. Uh, seems to me that Patrick, the person, is now this kind of combination of the bio, the bio stuff and this other stuff. Um, most of this other stuff not even being attached to his body most of the time. Um, if you were to hack into and destroy his resources here, that would be a crime against, against Patrick, the person. It wouldn't just be a, a crime against his cyber property. Uh, as Dan Dennett once said, it might be a bit like inflicting brain damage on someone while they're asleep. That would be a really bad thing to do. Um, but it will be just as bad to damage his webs and Evernote records and so on. Um, this is someone that wasn't skilled at using the technologies beforehand. This is David Dory. He has amnesia following a brain aneurysm. He too can't lay down new personal memories. But he did manage to learn to use an iPod Touch to keep a grip on what he's doing and when. Much harder work for him than it was for Patrick. Um, but he says, without it, I wouldn't know where to go or what to do. It would feel like I was floating. Um, I think, you know, 20, 30 years ago, people like Jones and Dory were often placed in care 24-7. This is a huge difference. So I think the moral of that is also that we're not that different to them. You know, we're kind of scaffolded and augmented and extended by all of these, um, all of these devices and tech that we wrap around ourselves. And I think if we're right to think about Jones and Dory as kind of extended um, sort of biotechnological hybrid systems, then we should think about ourselves that way too, because the only difference is the capacities that are supported by, um, by the bio bit, but that's not, you know, I don't see any reason to, um, to privilege that here. So I think if they're living examples of cyborg minds, then we are too. And that's actually, in the end, that's for me, that's the main reason to buy something like a, a radically embodied or extended mind story. I think you can sort of you can run the argument sort of to the point where it looks pretty much like a draw until you get to the issues about um, 
ethics and morality, and then I think we're way better off with the extended cyborg story. But there are lots of questions left. Um, you might say, well, you know, what's going on in the brain here? Because neural plasticity is playing a huge role here. So again, I understand this stuff. You better 